I'm Scott Tickers, and this is the How to Write Funny podcast. My guest on this episode is stand-up comedian, writer, and actress Jen Kirkman. Jen, you seem to be sailing in your comedy career right now. Mm. How long did that take you? Okay, I'm having a hard time not wanting to argue that I don't know what if it's sailing because to me I have a really high watermark for if something's sailing so if I know that I could live more than a year without working and not worry then I would say that but I don't I can't say that I get that there's a lot of things I have a lot of ups and downs that happen at the same time so it's impossible for me to feel like anything's sailing like uh I'm right. I have great credits in my career happening right now, but I also have giant no's that I never expected because. So anyway, it took me t- ten. Mm, it took me until 2008 to get my first steady paying job in show business, and I started in '97. Okay. So. Um, so we're looking at 20 years total, till now. So yeah, I've been but about in 10 years to get a steady. Years, yeah, 10 years to get a steady writing gig. Yeah. Well, I do just want to assure you that you are sailing. Well, like from here's any the thing. by like, any objective standard. Like I've done two Netflix specials. Yeah, they won't give me a third, and oh. I thought I'm in the bag. Like I'm in the scene. the The first one did really well. It was critically acclaimed. New York Times. the The ratings were so good. They don't tell you what the numbers are, hmm. but I heard right away. Oh my God, it's doing so well. Within a week, here's money for the second one. Right. We don't have to approve the material. Double the money. Let's do wow. this. Film that one. Somehow it gets buried. Can't do a third. So that's like. That's like first time director complex where they do a first movie that's like a big breakout Sundance thing. And then their second movie tanks. They never work again. That's the the worry that I have is is um, now it's just kind of an oversaturated. Now, here's the thing. And what's what's great about it, because I'm not bad mouthing them at all. If let's say, I don't know, I'm trying to think of someone. Oprah watched it and tweeted. Everyone watched this and 50 million people tweeted it, watched it. Um, any of my specials, the second one, then I'm back on the board. I'll probably get another one. So it's not uh, like a, it's really ratings based. Nobody at Netflix is saying, we don't think you're funny. You can't have this. Yeah, no, it's purely numbers. It's purely numbers. Yeah, no, I get that. Which I appreciate. So in one way, I'm disappointed by that. By the time this airs, maybe that will change. We have no idea. I could go somewhere else. There's other options, blah, blah. And it's not so much that I'm dying to get a special It's really because it's an international market and it's the only place doing that. So Mm. I know I can film one myself and put it up somewhere. I don't, it's not about me. It's really just, I want out there, you know, more people finding me. Um, And yet, yeah, so I don't, I'm a working comic and TV writer and I can get meetings that most people, people would want to get and can't get. So I do have a lot that other people are still striving for. I always just think, God, it's been 22 years. Shouldn't there be more? You know, that kind of thing. Yeah, so you're still feeling the slog and you're still feeling feeling like you get too many no's at meetings and stuff like that. Yeah, or just no's that I'm like, I don't have anything else for you people. It's not mm. like, hey, you know what? Uh why don't you sell us something about clowns? And I'm like, oh, I also <laughs> write about clowns. Of course, I'll, I'll right. do that. It just, but, but then again, I'm sitting in my hotel room in Chicago about to do a gig tonight and I knew I could sell a big room. So it, everything is fine. I, most people I know who are still breaking in would die to be where I am, but I tell them once you're there, it's not a guarantee. So you never feel secure you might just go, oh, this is cool, but you're working every second to get people to find out that you exist. And so I have two careers. I have a TV writer career and stand-up comedian career. Right. And really, you know, it just depends on what we're talking about. Yeah, so the other thing, I mean, it feels like they're both going really well. Yeah, I'd say my TV writing career is something that goes well in the sense that I've written on shows. I was just writing on The Marvelous Mrs. Maisel. Yeah. I just resigned from that so I could tour. I never meant to stay that long. And then I usually sell a pilot every year to a network and then it usually doesn't go, which is Typical. totally fine. I mean, most it's it's once I have sold it and written the script and turned it in, I do not expect 
it to get made. So there's no disappointment when now, I get what are, the no. Do you even know what the odds are, like, realistically? Someone told me that maybe 500 people pitch, go into a network and pitch an idea. I don't know if it's 500 per network, 500 total. I don't know what the numbers are. 500 per year? Per year, yeah. Okay. So, but let's say it's hundreds of people pitch one network every September and then they maybe buy 50 scripts and then out of those they make four you know it's just the nut and then after they, after they make your pilot do, does it get does picked it even up get aired? I mean, how many of those four than, <laughs> they make more than four pilots they probably make 10 but it's like the odds get 10 out of 50 yeah no yeah it goes you. from like 60 percent to 40 to 20 to 10 so nobody should be disappointed if their thing doesn't get picked up they could be disappointed like oh that would have been fun but if you're more disappointed than that then you're not gonna you're gonna drive yourself crazy and 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 the thing is when just selling something ups your they don't actually count it as a loss in the business when you don't get it picked up so the next year because you sold something the year before it's like come on back it's actually really forgiving that way so i always say if you look around la there's a ton of nice houses and you've never seen a show that any of these people have yeah, there was a book on screenwriting once, and I can't remember what the name of it was. It was interviews with a bunch of screenwriters, and there was a guy in there who's like a, you know, makes multi million dollars a year by yeah. producing screenplays that no one ever sees because he makes so much money just optioning spec scripts or, you know, selling scripts that studios have ideas for, and he makes a great living. That would drive me insane <laughs> to produce things that never get seen by people. Yeah, I but guess. But they, you know, it's good, good money. I guess if it's like not your, maybe it's not totally his passion or once he got the taste of that money, I mean, I don't have that, that money rolling in. So I'm, but because, you know, it would be the equivalent to me of like not being able to do a special that would, that would make me more crazy than, than someone saying, we're not going to make this thing because when you have a show that you've written, if they don't pick it up, there's also a lot of relief where it's like this, it would have been great to have that money or recognition, but yeah, yeah. doesn't mean the show is going to be good. Yeah, no, that's the other, <laughs> the last, I guess, of those whittling percentages is, is the show actually going to be a hit? Right. Like that, the percentage of those feels infinitesimal because there's so many shows and how many are hits? 2%? Yeah. You know, so it's... <laughs> and so many shows can seem so funny in the writer's room. It's good writing. Right. It's good stuff going on but then just once it makes its way onto the screen it just doesn't come off right i don't know what it is but yeah there's probably a lot of shows that aren't good but i bet when you're in those writers rooms it's very funny technically of course so do you enjoy the writing of those and the pitching of them those pilots Sometimes I have to take a step back and go, I actually don't even know what I enjoy. Like truly, deeply, the only thing I enjoy is doing stand-up comedy. But at a certain point, if you have enough, um, I don't know, notoriety or agents and managers and people, I guess at just a certain point in your career, if you're being represented by people, they, they encourage you to do it all. And really the only way to get people to see your stand-up comedy is to be on television. Yeah, and it's like another vertical or whatever. It's like you want to be firing on all cylinders yeah. to build your platform and find more people and you know, make a career. Then you can do the stand-up more easily because if you don't do all that stuff, you're, you're like a road comic and you're just trying to find people to come to your show, <laughs> right? Yeah, exactly. And at least this way, even if my stuff never makes it on TV, I do have a side job. I don't have to stress so much and travel 52 weeks out of the year. But right. I would say the first, I, I think, you know, I've always had ideas roll around in my head for TV shows. I've written scripts. When I came to LA, it, it was, somebody said, you have to write spec scripts to get a writing job. And so I wrote a Will and Grace script or something. And, you know, I think I let, I already had a manager because of stand up. So I was lucky in that way that I didn't have to break into um, the business like just with a script because I think that must be really hard. But it wasn't until um, I started writing on Chelsea lately that I got, actually, that's not even true. I didn't have a writing agent. 
when I was writing on Chelsea lately, I just had a manager, but this Chelsea Handler had produced a show called the comedians of Chelsea lately. And we did a show on the E network. We did a stand up show. So there was a 10 minute clip of me professional from television going around on YouTube. Got it. And it was about me being married and blah, blah, blah. And the two guys that were writing this sitcom about marriage saw it and said, we need a entry level writer to be in the room who's not jaded and hasn't been in this network system forever. That's funny and is a stand up and that can pitch jokes and give a fresh take on marriage. These guys were maybe 10 years older than me. They'd written on friends. They'd been around forever. The 30 rock everything. And most of the, you know, the, if you're, once you write on a sitcom, you're in the writer's guild. And so the first level of writer's guild is you're not expected to be coming in with scripts and all the story ideas. You're just there to be funny, pitch jokes, blah, blah, blah. Anyway, they met with me over lunch. I said, I already have this job writing on Chelsea lately. I get to be on camera. I really don't think I want to go into writing sitcoms. And then I just like decided to do it. I just decided to take the leap because I thought, well, I'm not touring as a stand-up. Nobody knows me. I haven't made it in quotes. That was back when I thought, you know, oh, I've been doing this for 15 years. I should have made it as a comic by now, which I was wrong about. So I, I jumped over to write for them. And the minute I signed on to that, I got an agency coming after me to represent me as a writer. But they didn't take writing on the Chelsea Late Night Show. Um, they didn't take it seriously. Was it yeah, not a non-union not, show? Or it was union. Okay. It, they just wanted... So I, I don't think they realized yet that it was going to continue being a, a thing and growing. They wanted just someone with that network credit. But anyway, my whole point about that was that's the first like sitcom writing job I had. And um, after that, I, I was sitting there realizing, no, I'm not happy just doing this. I, I, ha- I want to go back to Chelsea Lately. And they let me come back. Great. And that was great. And then that show ended after a season anyway, the NBC show. I think it was, it was called Perfect Couples. And it was actually, again, it was really funny. It just didn't go more than a season. It was a really that terrible year for NBC where nobody was watching any show. It was like every show had bad ratings and they just kept cleaning house and turning things over and trying to find the right things. But, <laughs> They're only going to have more years like that. <laughs> yeah. And so then after that was like, I went back to the Chelsea show and then I just started pitching my own stuff. And because I had that one thing under my belt and people knew my stand up, I pitched a show to FX and they bought it and it, you never saw it. Yeah. And, tell me about you know, some of the shows that you pitched. Um, because you have a very distinct comedic persona, mm. and I'm assuming the shows are like based around that, or yeah. you're the star of it, or something like that, or they are like crazy, like you know, a goofy animated show about farm animals or something. Well, I pitched a ton of shows that never got bought. I pitched a show. I've been. I pitched a show to, I, not Cartoon Network. There was another animated, Adult Swim maybe. I don't know. This is like well over 10, 12 years ago. Okay. And it was about, I still think, I mean, I might not, no one steal this, but it was about a ghost that was a dork and he died in the lab in science class and he's stuck in the school and the jocks find him and they want to use him for nefarious things like, you can turn invisible and make the football fly and we'll win. And then of course this like goth girl falls in love with him. She loves the longing of like, you can't be with a ghost. This is way before like Twilight or any of that. Like, and I pitched it to Adult Swim and they, they just didn't get it. And I was like, it's a show about a ghost who's a teenager. And the, the last thing about him that's worrying him is that he's a ghost. He has the same problems teenagers right. have. It's a great idea for a show, but Adult Swim is too weird for that show. Like yeah. That show is, has a lot of potential for really good emotion and really good story. Yeah. And that's just not what Adult Swim <laughs> I does. Know, I guess you're right. I think I also pitched it to Cartoon Network. Disney was interested, but then they were like, it's too dark. It's about a ghost. I was like, what about Casper? Yeah, exactly. Come and on. And then 
this dark. This one guy, I think, what an about adult... Bambi's and the fire? I mean, the Disney. Literally, come Bambi's on. mother dies in a fire. I know. Snow White is poisoned to death. I mean, come on. And I was like, this kid doesn't know he's dead. Like, he's he's so happy. It's not talked about. He's just a see-through character on the he's show. Just see-through. Yeah, and I, somebody at Adult Swim was very confused that his best friend was a girl. And he's like, is this a woman's point of view? And I was like, I don't know. It's, we're talking about a ghost. A, first of all, I'm talking about a cartoon. Then it's a ghost. What do you say? Are you worried there's going to be like a period? What, what do you think is going to happen? I said, it's like Edward Scissorhands and the Winona Ryder character. It's exactly. like perfect. I'm like, it's, it's gothy longing. She, she's like a Dora the Explorer. Like, have you had problems with female <laughs> cartoons in the past? Is this a bad thing? Right. I said, it's equal, man and woman. They were like, it's just, we just don't do a lot of female perspective. And I kept going, I've literally pitched seven characters. All of them are male. But I mentioned one woman and then I'm a woman. And then it became, is this too much of a female perspective? And I was like, I don't know what a female perspective is. So I don't get that either. Because if all their shows are like for dudes, for like for high bros, put a show on that might appeal to more women and maybe you'll get more viewers. Like... I, I don't. Will, think, I this don't is the bane of my existence for anything, whether you're talking about different races or or LGBTQ, well, whatever it is. Is like, why would you just not have everything? Whatever. Anyway, but so a lot of stuff I've pitched that didn't go anywhere. I mean, since 2003, stupid crap with <laughs> friends of mine, where it's like, is half, there any half, pro- <laughs> half reality? I pitched things that are now shows. You know that. You know, my girlfriends and I used to run a room in in New York City in the late 90s and we would get on stage and just kind of improvise and have comics come up that were not really accepted at comedy clubs, but working the alternative rooms. And that, you know, was meltdown with Jonah and Kumail like 10 years later. Not that they stole that. That's not what I mean at all. But there's certain ideas that are they're just ideas in the transom and yeah, somebody's going to make it happen. We were ahead of our time. But but uh, the sitcoms I pitched that. So the FX one was, uh, I was divorced. I'd just written a book about not having kids. So it was about a woman who doesn't want kids and people are driving her crazy and blah, blah, blah. It would always be starring me, me playing the person, but they wouldn't be a stand-up. Okay. Um, Because we have enough of that, you know? And there's literally nothing interesting about being a stand-up because I've had so many day jobs that are so... I, I pitched a show about an office before the office, you know, <laughs> of course. and, um, but you know, I've had so many day jobs. I know the office was a British show. I'm sure I didn't pitch it before that, but it was before I knew of that. Right. Um, so I just think any show I pitch will, will take from all areas of my life. So I always like the character to be somebody who has done a job that I've done before. There, there is nothing interesting about stand up that, we haven't seen like Seinfeld did it perfectly. We don't need any more, in my opinion. Um, then, yeah, most of them are just sort of a similar thing where it's it's me living whatever life I'm living with a bunch of characters. But I'm trying. The last one I sold um, that didn't go was to BBC, and I was over in London. I pitched it there, and I just found out a couple months ago they're not going to do it. But it was a woman who's like. In her, she's about to turn 40. Her boss is British. He's like a fancy hotelier designer. And she's almost like, I always say like if Seth Rogen's character was a woman. Like she's kind of a slacker. She makes good money at this job. She gets her boss's benefits. She gets to travel all over. She's never really thought about what she wants. And she meets a guy in London when she's over there for work. And they date long distance for two years. And then her boss is like, I'm picking up and moving the business to London. And she just kind of assumes that, well, I'll just move in with my long distance boyfriend. And there's just not, it, this all kind of happens in the intro really quick, but she kind of moves in with him. Then she gets dumped on her 40th birthday. Mm. He's like, this all moved too fast. And, you know, it's about a woman who's like impulsive, looks before she leaps. I mean, leaps before she looks doesn't really know what she wants in life and then realizes, wait a minute, I'm 40. I live in London now. I have to get my life together. And what she ends up doing is taking a break from, from dating and all that kind of stuff. And she's, if the show went, she would have ended up like kind of a self-help guru Hmm. who writes a book about Uh how to get your life together and blah, blah, blah. 
Um, so anyway, so I mean, it's always some kind of weird, I'll take one kernel of myself, like I'm 40 and <laughs> let's see where we, where we can go from there. That's a great idea though, because you don't see really ever, well, I guess we saw it, Melissa McCarthy did it in Bridesmaids and Tina Fey toyed with it a little bit on 30 Rock, but a, a woman playing the slob archetype, mm -hmm. it's so rare. And it would have been fun to see that person transform into a guru. Well, that's because I had a version of this show that I sold to ABC two, two years ago. And it was one of those, she has everything together in her life, except once she goes through this breakup, she's like, I don't even want to try anymore. I don't want to date anymore. I'm just going to go a year being single. And it's, you know, obviously hard to be single when you're at that age where all of your friends are in relationships and do you go to weddings alone and, you know, fun things like that. But when I was writing it, I kept thinking, God, there's nothing fun about someone who has everything else perfectly together in their life. And yeah, and I liked the, the idea more of like, it's not, it, whenever women in stuff are supposed to be slackers, it's always bottle of wine, woo! And it's like, she's not a drunken mess. <laughs> she just is literally like, I don't know, I had this job, I never stopped working it. Uh, shoot, I don't know what I want to do. And she works with a millennial who's like, oh, I want to be just like the boss. And he's got his whole life planned out. And he's like, what's your life plan? She's like, I never had one, you know? And so, I, yeah, I think that that, it doesn't have to be so extreme, like they're this loser, you know? Right. But, um, but technically she has a nice life. You know, if she got married to this guy and worked as someone's high level assistant, that's a great life. But when everything falls apart and she has to like really admit, I didn't move here for my job. I moved here for this guy. Like, I don't really know what I want or like, or, you know, whatever. I always think that's more interesting. And um, so I hope to keep pitching stuff like that, especially at an older age. I think like, you just... Nobody cares in their 30s if you don't have your life together. Right. But you I think th what? I think you just described the female perspective. Like having things be so open-ended and not knowing what's going to happen, not having all this complexity and contradictions and stuff. Mm. I think guys want, and I want, like yeah. clear irony, clear stakes. Like I want answers. <laughs> you know oh, what I mean? interesting. And I think it's more directed and more basic. Yeah. And it's not like, that's almost like a chick think piece <laughs> you just described. Right. So we are saying as a viewer, you want that? Yeah, as a viewer, I want that. As a male viewer, as a male you viewer, want answers. I want it simple, dumb, and <laughs> with answers. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but you don't. So the idea of someone like not you don't you can't contemplating tell where, this... where they're at in their life and right, all those right. questions. That's a female perspective. I feel like. I mean, I'm just going out on a limb here, but I, I, I don't think know. You, I think I, you nailed it. I don't know. I mean. It's funny too because at least this character on this show I was thinking of, she's literally not contemplating anything. It's other people going, "When are you this? When are you that?" And but it makes like, the audience yeah. think about all those questions yeah. and it shows her like going through that struggle or whatever. Yeah. And facing all these unknowns or whatever. I just don't believe there is a male or female perspective. I truly, truly don't. I really don't. There may not be, but yeah. if if one had to be defined in mm -hmm. in the industry for like a development executive to know what was what. I think that was it. Oh, I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah that makes a lot of sense. Because the, the men want the character goes from A to B. Yeah. And yours is more like, oh, let's see what she discovers or whatever. See what direction she's pulled in. Well, I think you know a lot. Of, it's funny because all of this, like, we'll see where it goes. I would never be able be able to say that in a pitch. Because in the pitch, you know exactly where it goes. I'd have and, to say, yeah. she's going to end up this, but we're going to see. It's like you have to relax them first. This is where we end up, but <laughs> and we're going to go. It's going to be a fun here. journey. Yeah, we're going to hear, 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 hear. But I do think there is such a, I am a good pitcher. There's an art to the pitch. And I was going to ask you about that. Yes, I think it's it's more important than, I don't know if any of my ideas would get bought if I wrote the script first. You know, I mean, that's not how it works anyway, but. I think my pitching might even be superior to my pilot writing. Although I'm not sure. That's, I don't have any idea. But, but yeah. You probably are because you're a stand-up and you're good on your feet. And that's like all you need, right? To be comfortable in your own skin and be able to talk to people. Yeah. And I'm a good like student too. So, you know, you have to. 
like it's so involved. It's three months of just grunt work. What you know, I'll tell my manager or my agent, I have an idea. They'll say, Great, let's set you up with some production companies. You can have meetings, you can pitch them. So before I even get there, I have to get everything down. Who are the characters? What would the pilot be? What's the, you know, usually they want some kind of, that's where being a stand-up does come in handy because usually you are basing it around your own life. So they love a true story. This really happened. My mom turned into a butterfly. And they're like, wow, I can't believe it. And then you tell them roughly where it would go in series. And then you might even at the production company say, I'd like to write this with someone. If you guys can help me find a co-writer um, or a showrunner or whatever. So the pressure is less at the production meeting pitch because you're also looking to them to maybe, they might say, you know what? We have a real in at NBC, but only if you use this writer, Susie Doozy. She's great. So if we compare you two, I mean, that's going to be great. So then after that, once you get your team together, if you work with a certain production company, then it's a few weeks to a month, however long you have, going over every detail here are the characters. This is each of their journey. This is how they relate to each other. This is a sample episode of the pilot. This is where it goes in series. What's the arc? What's the point? What's the stakes? And sometimes the questions are so maddening to me when people go, what are the stakes? I go, I don't care. Like, I don't, what are the stakes to anything, to Roseanne? I mean, it's, and I'm talking about the first, the stakes are I'm raising a family on a budget. I mean, what it, it the, the ask these questions that nobody watching at home goes, I, you know, I'm really enjoying this because the stakes of this sitcom are this or that, you know, it, it makes me crazy. But, um, and then you go and pitch it to the network and it's a lot. It's like 20 minutes of just talking and trying to get them to not glaze over. And it's a lot because you're, you're like, they're, they have no idea what you're going to say. And in 20 minutes, you're going to introduce them to six characters, possibly, how they all know each other, what each one's thing is, what the plot of the pilot is. And so there's a way to do it where, you know, then you come introduce yourself. Hi, I'm Jen. Blah, blah, blah. Tell a funny story. And you're like, oh, I'm going to tell you about this. But it's like a lot of like, but hang on before I get there. And you just sort of slide it all in and, and you might describe the pilot episode and as you're doing it that's where we meet each character and then you you know but if you have a a co-writer or even just a producer that's not writing it with you but you can talk with them I've done that before too where it's like me pitching but somebody's jumping in and I've co-written something with someone where we both pitched together and we kind of acted acted it out in front of them and and uh someone told me once you cry they buy if you cry, they yep, die. you get a little emotional because they know it's a real personal story. I don't know what it is. They just think, oh, the, the, and that happened. The last thing I sold a couple years ago, I, it was like, and then her friends come together and she learns that she's okay. And like, you kind of make a joke about it. Like, sorry, I'm going to cry, but like, it really <laughs> is true. Like you learn you're okay. And they're like, oh my God, let's do it. That's so great. Yeah. <laughs> The greatest feeling is when in the room they go, let's do it. Yeah. So where do all your ideas come from? And I know that's a stupid, basic question to ask any comedy person. But Yes. My, I mean, not yes, but No, yes, no, it I is. That's what mean. everybody asks. And it's a dumb question because, of course, they come from your brain. Yeah. <laughs> but what, I'm, what I mean is what drives you to do comedy? Why did you get into it? What do you like about it? What does it do for you? It keeps changing. Um, not sure why I got into it. I always wanted to be in show business in some capacity. So that went from being a dancer, being in musicals, being an actor. I want to be in a band. I mean, I wanted to be in everything. And at the end of the day, once you realize you can't just be those things, you can actually just be a stand-up. You can just get on stage and do it, even if you're not getting paid right away. I think when I first started, I'm going to be totally honest, Everyone always is like, when did you know you were funny? It's like, I never started because I thought it was funny. I thought I was important. I thought I was Lenny fucking Bruce. I was like, I don't know where I got this from. 
I was just a real overly dramatic and serious 21 year old. And I just thought, I'm going to tell the truth. I was like <laughs> dying for justice of some kind. Like, Did you political material? No, but I was a political person, if that makes sense. But I would do stuff that I didn't even believe in. Like I would, not stuff I didn't believe in, but like sitting on a stool and making fun of women's magazines. I love women's magazines. I love fashion magazines. I love makeup. I love the whole thing. But I would be like, sitting on a stool smoking <laughs> you know because um, people love hearing those things made fun of i think so i mean no one even cared it was like 20 people in boston when i started but but that was really why i got into it. it was like i have something to say and then as you start saying things and you hear yourself and you grow up a little and a couple years go by you're like i'm not saying anything at all and then you do it to be i don't know exactly I just think it's I like to I mean I don't know I like to perform I would say the drive is more hey do you guys feel this way I mean to me it all comes down to I'm gonna die is anyone else scared and since you're not allowed to talk about that all day long you can just um get away with it by by doing stand-up in a way everything I do is you guys understand this, right? You, you feel the same way, right? So I'm not, when they laugh, I don't feel excited like, huh, I'm so funny. I think, oh, good. We're all relating here. Do you think that's why you were interested in performing your whole life? No matter what it was, you just wanted to connect with people in some way? No, I don't think it was that deep. I it think was, it became deeper. Yeah, okay, I see. So later on, you wanted that connection, but early it was just, I'm important, I need to be seen. But even before that, it was really just more like um, childhood frivolous fun, (laughs) you know, like, but then you realize as you, you know, when you're a little kid, you're not like, what's my, what's my job plan? You know, I was watching the Muppet show going, oh my God, this is so fun. I want to put outfits on and I love being in my dance recital and I love doing this and doing that. Like when I was a little kid, I just thought show business seemed fun. It was truly just there's no rhyme or reason. Nobody would be correct if they analyzed it. I'd be overthinking it. But it was just the joy in my heart. But you're so prolific. Like, it seems like there's something driving you. Not that many people write that many pilot scripts and produce that many specials and that much stand-up material. It seems like a lot for somebody who's just doing it because it's fun. Well, you said now there's more to it. It's deeper. You're finding a connection. But are you just a hard worker? I'm a hard worker. Well, look, now it's just like, it's shit. Now it's become what I do for a living, so I can't stop. I literally, if I found a bag of money, I would stop. I'm not (laughs) overly competitive or ambitious, but since I'm doing it, I am. But truly, I don't need to be remembered or thought of. I don't care. I just don't have that thing that I see in, um, well, I'll get to that in a minute, but watching the Gary Shandling special, I was like, these middle-aged men cannot fucking deal with the fact that they're not going to be famous or around anymore. And what they're going through is just what it feels like to be a female comic. Like, nobody cares, and we do whatever, and we probably won't be remembered. They're in a panic because everyone pays attention to what they say. And so since I've made it to middle age without anyone really giving a shit, and I don't mean that negatively, I don't have to worry about keeping this legacy going. Like, I'm just like, oh, awesome. I can relax, you know. Um, But in terms of the drive, you know, with stand-up, I always have people go, how do you come up with new stuff? Like, my stand-up friends. And I'm like, if you just go inside your own head and go, what do I think about this? Why do I think that? You Endless. You get endless material. Well, you do an hour podcast a week, right? Yeah. And you just go off. Just almost stream of consciousness, right? Or do you have little notes? Notes in the sense that I'll write guy in the cab. Okay. And then that reminds me to tell a story of whatever. Listen, the good news about the podcast is that it's not supposed to be hilarious. It's just your (laughs) mind. It's a look inside your mind. It's just talking about whatever for anyone that... I love solo podcasts, so I do it knowing I know exactly what everyone's doing right now listening to this. They're half listening. They're washing the dishes. It's, they just want a voice. They, they just, just want, want somebody voice. to be with. I, when podcasts first came out, I loved This American Life, and now I don't. I used to love falling asleep to it, and then I couldn't because it would be like, I have a glass of ice down here. 
and then he'd interview someone and they'd be like, they'd be on a different level. And then world music comes in like clang, clang, blah, blah. And I was like, this is, it was too maddening. I just like the sound of one person talking. And so it's almost like, um, there are people that write me and they say my husband's autistic and he can't stand certain noises. And the only thing he can stand is the sound of your podcast. So I swear to you, it's this weird small sect of the population that wants that. And I don't even know if they care what I'm saying half the time. That's so great. <laughs> you must enjoy doing it. It's fun, right? Yeah, that I enjoy doing. And and I have ads on it. So it's kind of cool to, to get paid a little bit for it. But yeah. but with stand up, it's like, yeah, that I don't know. It, it It's kind of, if you don't obsess over jokes too much or take it too seriously, you can always have a, you can always be funny on stage. I mean, again, like a special, I'd put a lot more effort into than I would a gig, if that makes sense. Yeah. So, but you want the gig to be funny. Like you're getting some really hearty laughs. Don't you want to somehow harness those and get them in a special or is a lot of this stuff? Okay. So you're you're building a new special ultimately when you're doing stand up. Is that your kind of stand up goal? Not anymore, but I do know in the back of my head, that's a keeper that that'll last that that could be evergreen and last forever. That's a good thing to put out there. But live audiences are more forgiving because there's an excitement about being course, there, yeah. especially if they know you already. So I don't mean I don't try as hard. I try my hardest, but part of and I don't I'm my one brag I'll say about myself. And again, it's not for everybody, but for the people that find me funny. I can improvise off the top of my head and they laugh. Um, And I would say that it is funny. It's not me phoning it in or being like, they'll love it. But I know better than to do it on a special where it just needs to be a little tighter, a little whatever. So if I, like, let's say tonight I do a show, I make some stuff up off the top of my head, which I will. Uh, if any of it strikes me as something that needs to be said again, I'll perfect it and perfect it and perfect it. But sometimes it's just for the wind. It's just for tonight and now we're done. And that to me is the joy of live comedy. That's so great. The The way you're describing how you approach comedy, it's like one of the more emotionally stable responses I've ever heard from a comedian. It's like, I enjoy it. It's fun. It's a job I could leave tomorrow if I got a big pile of money. It's like, yeah. there's no angst involved. It doesn't seem like there's no insecurity involved. It's like, you are you know what you're good at and you work hard at it. And it's just like really impressive. My angst comes on the business side of it. Ah. My angst and insecure. Well, I don't think I'm insecure, but my angst is like today. I did this show here in Chicago called Windy City. Windy City Live? Windy City Live. It's like the local, the view. Yeah. And it's great. And it seems like a lot of people watch it. So I'm there, hair and makeup. They're putting a microphone on me. There's another comedian going on. Um, And there's a manager of a comedy club, I won't say the name, who is there and she's with the other comedian. Now, just putting two and fucking two together, you would see, oh, there's a girl here being mic'd up and everything. Uh, She's probably on the show with the comedian this woman was watching over. They probably don't put someone off the street on a comedy panel. She's probably, at the very least, some kind of show business personality. Okay, so she goes, you look familiar. I go, oh, I'm Jen Kirkman. Now, I would never say that to the average person. But she's a a comedy club owner. And I'm one of 100 working comics in America. So I thought, she probably hasn't seen me in a while. My hair is different. I've never met her, but I mean, and she goes, mm, nope. I go, uh, I've been touring comic for a decade. Chelsea Lately, Drunk History. I have two Netflix specials. She goes, no. And I was like, what the F do I have to do to get, first of all, bizarre, then get out of the business if you don't know one of the comics working in the country. And I'm a woman, so that's even less. Right. B, there was no moment for her of like, oh my God, I'm so sorry, I'm an idiot. I'm the one that's wrong here. Just, I should know you. Yeah, just unapologetically. Nope. Then she asked me to host the show at the club that night, which is like saying to someone that owns a bank, do you want to pick up a quick teller shift? And I said, no, I'm here headlining my own show at a venue. She goes, oh. She stared at me and just kept going, huh. 
She's like, I don't know. I was like, that will drive me crazy. Not literally in my heart. I would say there's two things. Is something hurting me in my soul or is it bothering me in my head? So that's bothering me in my head. A little bit in my soul. Where I'm like, what? Th- that, I don't know what I need from that. Some, some kind of respect, some kind of something. But I go, I work too goddamn hard. That's and what I'm I was too say. good at what I do. It's about the, the years you've put in yeah. and the work. Like it should show at that moment. It's just, <laughs> just something like this blows. And then at the end of the day, it's like, who cares? I'm still going to my show tonight and getting paid. Bye. But I think that's why I don't have anything go to my head because I have moments like that every day. And then moments like I'll have tonight where I assume people will be laughing and going nuts way more than they should be. So I always know I'm, I'm neither that nor that. I'm just somewhere in the middle. Yeah, but, but one thing you do have, back to what we were talking about before, about like getting promoted by somebody who's like a super famous person and yeah. suddenly you get all this attention. You do have a platform and you have fans. Mm-hmm. And there are people who follow you and know you. And you have a lot of social media followers and stuff like that. So when you go to a town and you put out the word, like, you know, you can fill a a theater pretty well. And that takes a long time to build. And that's a super valuable thing. Yeah, that's harder than you think, too. I I am busting ass to get asses in seats. I have a theory. This is my numerical theory. I probably have 5,000, I would say, depending on the size of the city, one to 5,000 people in every city who would be willing to come see me. From I'm your biggest fan to that sounds fun. That's great. However, that's not the percentage of people that show up because that's just not life. Of course. So I know this from book sales. So when someone gives you a book deal, if you have 250,000 Twitter followers, they don't expect all 250 to buy it. But when I got a book deal, I was like, holy, I was doing 10 bucks times 250,000. And I was like, I'm rich. And then what they explained to me was, we expect 2% of those people to buy it if you're lucky. Yeah. So of these one to 5,000, maybe three to 500 will show up. Now, within that, that's if they find out. I struggle to get people to join my email newsletter. They, Twitter is insane now. It used to be eight years ago, people would see what you were posting. Um, I have people who literally are, have tweeted me today, do you ever play Chicago? My social media has been nonstop because it just goes so fast. It's not yeah. their fault. So it's so hard to get. And, uh, you know, I do these silly shows and I do the, I mean, silly shows meaning like the, the TV and the radio. Right. It's, I don't know how, so you have to have, my, this is my number theory, five million people in a city know you. And then one to 5,000 show up at your 5,000 seat theater. And that's how you play 5,000 seat theaters. It's not because 5,000 people know you. It's because 5 million do. So I'm still on the, we've got a few hundred coming. Some cities, it could be a thousand, but it, I never know. I have no guarantee, no idea. And I'm obsessed with ticket sales. I'm every week. What are the numbers? What are the numbers? What are the numbers? Fascinated and obsessed. How many people will this theater sit in Chicago? This is a, if it was standing room, only 700. And with seats, it's 500. Four or 500 with seats. Listen, if 700 people wanted to come, they'd make it happen tonight. Of course. Tonight will probably be closer to 400. But that was like, I can't even explain how much promotion went into it for months. So what do you do besides the social media? Do they buy ads? Like what else do you do to promote? I have a stuff. publicist who I work with depend like she's not a you know some people just employ one all the time to handle you get all their it scandals when you're doing and things. A tour. Yeah, I just say, you know what? I think Philly might need some help Chicago. There's so many people we got to get them all angles. So I hire her per city depending on If I do a comedy club, I don't normally use my publicist cuz they have their own giant mailing list and, and they get everybody. Too. So yeah, so you're only dealing with a fraction of the people that you would need to fill that, right? Yeah. So with something like here, I get my publicist on board. So we do TV, radio, little articles that come out. I'll do it on my podcast. I have my newsletter. I do all the social media. I might boost an ad, you know, like 
as they do on Facebook and Instagram. Right. I yep. recently just got banned, so I don't know. From Facebook? Yeah, not banned from Facebook, but they said you can't do ads anymore. You huh. you didn't comply with the rules one time. And I said, well, tell me what I did. And they just kind of write back like a robotic answer, like, yeah, you didn't comply, sorry. Sometimes it's as stupid as you put a photo up that has too much words in it. Right, I've heard and that. I think they're cracking down finally, <laughs> a little too late, on... Um, Russian memes, memes from Russia. Uh -huh. And so I think anything with pictures and words is scary. So, um, but I used to do that, that, that worked. So they're going back and saying, oh, you did it a year ago or whatever. And yeah, like I tried banned? to place an ad. They're like, oh, your account's been blocked from oh, being able to do man. this. Oh, cause you hadn't done it in a, a year. Cause I hadn't done it in a while. But oh. you know, it's, a, I always do this and it really works is I make videos on Instagram and I say, tag a friend they don't follow me and tell them to come or get a group or I try to appeal each city to, you know, I, I don't know. I try to just make a case for seeing live comedy. I think that's what it is too, is people watch Netflix and they, they don't know that you're doing different material. Right. Or they just don't know that this is what we want to do for a living. And Netflix is a commercial. It's not the other way around. Yeah. Yeah. No, people don't understand it at all. Yeah. And they probably also don't understand how much work it is for you because if you're on TV, they figure you've got a zillion dollars and you're doing great. Exactly. And like you say, there's so much stuff out there to try to get people's attention. Like you can do all the TV and all the radio and yeah. reach out to social media and boost your ads and everything. And still people will I see send why you people a, a tweet sex that tapes. says, hey. I swear to God, I give it all yeah. up to Kim Kardashian. <laughs> Or the way Madonna would just always try to push the envelope and do something crazy. But I appreciate that about your comedy is that, and maybe we could talk about this briefly. I'm sure you have thoughts about it. Yeah. You know, that stereotype that so many female comics have to do sex humor yeah. in order to get noticed. You don't do any more than an, a male comic would do who just does material about general life. Yes. And, you know, that's probably getting you less attention than if you were super shocking and over the top. You're a thousand percent right. And I remember... Um, my first Netflix special, it just so happened to be what was going on in my life. I was divorced and I went on a date and was in my late thirties with someone in their early twenties. So it was like, I had my, I had a one night stand and didn't like the cougar life bit, you know? And I did a bit about masturbation, which was so innocent. It was really about <laughs> having a backstory in your mind. And you know, a, it was a really just a polished up the difference between men and women bit. And that was so popular. And my second special, which I called my, like, here I am, I called it my George Carlin special. Like, not as brilliant as him or anything like that, but that sort of, I'm just talking about stuff. You know, it's not dating. It's not specific to being a woman. There was a couple things that were, like, street harassment and stuff. Um, some bits about that, but... Yeah, is yeah. that the JKL one? Yeah. Okay. So that one, you know just didn't pop as much and people that watched it liked it but um th i i think if i was someone who could stomach this i could have branded myself the i don't want kids i'm divorced ooh, ooh, i could have done that you kind of were though with the book and the first I special was, and then i thought i was allowed to I mean, no one's stopping me, but I never intended to stay there. It's no, like, I hear what you're saying. I'm you, reporting you thought from the brand rules were kind of establish it, and then you have your parameters widen and you can make choices. But people yeah. put you in a category and they expected that. And when they didn't get it, maybe they were like, oh, I thought this was the. You're like, oh, I like that one, but I don't know about this. And then <laughs> I'm not attracting new people necessarily. And I think people do want, even with Netflix and their algorithm, my first special, they were able to, if you watched a romantic comedy about divorce, mm. they'd recommend my special. Sure. Whereas this new one, they're like, I don't know what to do, oh. you know? And so the, uh, I think I absolutely, if I were smart, could have been the like, I'm single, slutty, and no kids, but I'm not. <laughs> so I couldn't, so I didn't. But I'm like, I absolutely know where I dropped the ball on that one. Like, So you must think about that a lot, like personal brand, because you're out there. You know, yeah. You're out there in so many different platforms. How do you define your personal brand now? It's, I don't have one, I don't think. If people want to tell me what they see, I'm like, oh, I see that. But I don't, I don't try for one because 
I'd probably get it. I, I don't know what's happening. I don't know who out there likes me. I'm trying to go for some Gen X thing right now, I think, in a weird way. Like, I'm trying to... You seem a little young for Gen X. Are I'm you on the tail end of it? 44, so I'm solid, like, teenager when Kurt Cobain killed himself. Okay. Yeah. No, I'm solidly Gen X. All right. I thought I was. What I'm are like you? I'm, like, 10 years older than you. Are you? Because well, like you are Reality too. Bites yeah. was a Gen X movie. I was in you know early college. Yeah, you, you would have been like you know ten or twelve. No, I was in college when <laughs> Reality Bites came out. Oh really? What was yeah. it ninety ninety two? No, it was ninety four. Ninety four. Okay. I know that. I think because I'm I just probably saw on the tail again. end of it, and you're on the tail. You're on the yeah. up end of it. I'm the on the down end of it. Because I just saw it again. Weirdly, is it any good? It did hold up. Huh. And I didn't like it when I first saw it. And then I saw it. And I think I didn't like it when I first saw it because I was defensive about being the age of those people. Mm. Isn't that like this? And then I saw it again. It came out. It was 25 year anniversary. It was playing in New York. Oh, wow. And I was in New York and I went to see it with my friend that I saw it with for the first time. And I was like, oh, my God, it's so cute. It's totally fine. It sounds just like what millennials are saying. We have no <laughs> money. You know, we got screwed by all these. So I feel like I'm trying to, I don't know what the Gen X thing is I'm going for, but I do talk about it a lot. I'm trying not to be the like, I'm old. You, I don't get you kids. I'm trying to say to, I'm hearing from a lot of millennials, which again, that could be your 20 or 35. I don't know what your millennial is, but. I think you nailed it. I think it's right in there. Yeah. I'm hearing from them like that they aspire to um, have the like self-assuredness of not just me, but anyone like my age and stuff like that and i'm realizing how these people have totally been they're i i they're just so um i don't think anyone's explained to them that they're going to be okay they feel freaked out because five years ago they were children you know and like when you're 44 and something bad happens you go oh when i was 34 something bad happened and i was fine you have like decades to look back on and they don't no one's explained to them, like, being in your 20s, you're an adult, but you're, like, still kind of a kid. And, like, you don't have to have anything figured out. I think our generation knew that. You S talked about that in one of your specials, the idea of gaining wisdom. Like, that you got you got wisdom. You don't remember that? So, um, I'm oh, yeah, but I was, like, joking wisdom. Like no, about but I, I think you, the album. subtext was that when you're older, you do gain wisdom about yeah. life. Well, like you were just saying. Yeah. Because you've been through some stuff. And that's what makes a George Carlin, like somebody who has wisdom about life and can talk about it in a knowing way that uh, younger people especially are like, oh my God, this person knows so much about life. I was worried for a while because it seemed like, and maybe that group has come and gone, they've probably grown out of it, but it seemed for a while in comedy, this was about 10 years ago, it was getting a little scary because there was a certain young person that didn't want to hear anything except exactly what they were doing. And a lot of us, and I was only in my 30s then, but even, I was feeling the pinch then. Hmm. And it was like, I don't know what, I don't know about Star Wars or <laughs> apps or, you know what I mean? Like, I didn't know what anyone was doing and right. people weren't laughing. And I was like, oh God, I am screwed. And then it seemed to come and go, but there was this quick period in comedy where we were all sort of backstage going, no one's getting any laughs but the 20-something <laughs> comics because they were just, and I, when I was little, I only laughed at adult stuff because nothing was catered towards me really so i want to ask you just a little question about process you yeah. mentioned the process you go through for writing scripts or writing jokes is really simple you just think about what you think about stuff mm -hmm. and you know a lot of people have opinions and you can turn an opinion into a joke really easily but what are some of the methods or tools that you use to turn an opinion into a joke or a funny concept or a funny story oh i have God, I don't know. It's like such a... A mental process that you've never had to articulate? Yeah. So <laughs> I wrote a book about it, so I articulated it, and I think about it, and I always like to ask other comedy industry people what their process is. I'm, I'd have to... Th and let me think if I can think of a specific thing. Uh, okay. So I'll talk about something I'm working on right now. So I'm working on like I was saying with this Gen X thing. I, obviously, I don't look old. Obviously, except for some minor neck arthritis, I don't have any aging-related things. Good. But I am older than... I'm old enough to be a 22-year-old's mother. And that is so strange to me 
and I'm trying to articulate without sounding like the old lady, the little things, like almost Seinfeld level small observations that make you go, I'm starting to be phased out in society. Like nobody, you know, like I used a typewriter in college and nobody, my nobody, you know, my 22 year old kid that I would have never needed to. So it, things are happening very fast, whatever. These aren't original thoughts. So I'm talking about how I feel old, but I know I don't want to talk about music because that you really sound old when you do that. What can I talk about? So I talked about how somebody I know, somebody I ran into, uh, like I have a candle burning in my room right now in this hotel room we're in. I always travel with candles. Sometimes I forget to bring matches and I will ask the front desk of the hotel for matches. Do and they, why do you do that? Why do I what? Bring the candles. I just like the smell. Okay. So they're like special scented candles. Yeah. Okay. No, it does smell good in here. And so I'm like, I've noticed with the front desk, there's like this, they're taken aback when I ask for a tool that makes fire. And I'm like, is it not allowed? I'm like, I'm not smoking. I'm just lighting a candle. But they're more just like, I don't even know, like matches. Why would we have that? They don't know that back in the day, matches just used to be everywhere right they the, have lighters or whatever just the things like, with the, the button you walk into a restaurant there's a stack of matches Yeah, everybody had their logo on a matchbox everything and that's like something we're not seeing anymore but it's small enough that it's funny it doesn't make people go oh haha sad only so it happened enough that i was like well i want to talk about getting older so i had that thought already how do i talk about getting older this match thing kept happening and then one day i was like I don't know if this is a generational thing, but I'm making it one because then I get to talk about getting older. And so then one time I asked a bouncer at a bar if he had a match, a book of matches, and he did not know what they were. And that's crazy. He was like, oh, I thought those were just for camping. Like he knew what a giant, you know, light when wet kind of thing was. Right. But anyway, so that process is like, okay, so. I don't want to shit on this person. I need to make it about me getting older. Let me over-exaggerate how much I care about this. And so I do a whole thing about that I'm just becoming ir irrelevant and obsolete the way like a phone would or something because I, do, I know what matches are and people don't. And I the, it goes into another thing about... Um, you know, VCRs. It's not, I'm not trying to get the like nostalgia value. That's the other thing. It's like, I have to be like, what can I do to make people nostalgic, nostalgic without just saying Pac-Man, you know, I want it to be so specific that they are like, yeah, totally. But not, we've heard that. Yeah. No, especially something that they haven't heard. Yeah. So I have to live in for something that is not even that great a bit. It's been living with me for six months. So I just go, I'm noticing something about matches. I bet that's something. And then over here, I'm going, I'm getting older. I'd love to talk about it in a way that I don't seem old. Oh, well, I'm sure. It, you know, and I just sort of let it be. And then one day, it'll just sort of hit. And I'll go, I'll combine these two things. And will it hit you like on stage and you'll just riff on it like you were saying? You'll improvise No, it? it'll hit me like driving or something. And then you'll write it down and get some thoughts. Then you'll work it up as a bit. Yeah. And then I, I once a month in LA, I do a show where I just blah. Great. And I... I might start talking and the audience knows like <laughs> I charge no money and it's like they're there to just Come enjoy the blab. process. <laughs> yeah. And I tape it and whatever. And then I start working it out and I'm still working it out. You tape and analyze tapes. No, you don't analyze them. I tape it in case I say something really brilliant that you can like, capture. I'll go, Oh, I think I said something here. I'll listen, but I, I don't oh, okay, really okay. listen to tapes. Got I it, should. Okay. That would be smart, but I'm way, I'm more hippy dippy about my process. I'm really not, I should listen, but I just don't like my voice. I, I just don't feel like listening to it. I hear you. And then is that the same thing with like a pilot script? You just sort of let ideas coagulate around you until they hit you? I don't know. Mm, oh God, I hate writing. <laughs> Most it's writers so do. Hard. It's um, very hard. With a pilot script, what will I do? I will... I, I, I wish I could articulate how the idea comes. I just don't know. But there's a lot, it's a lot more work. It's a lot more effort and sitting around thinking. And then the math of it. Why, if, 
she's going there. Why is he over here? Like putting the pieces of the story together. That I is so hard. I hate it. I <laughs> do you, hate it. Do you write down ideas for pilots? Like yeah. if you just have an idea, you'd get that on paper and then yeah. you at least have something to think about? Yeah, exactly. Okay. Because those come pretty easy, I would think. The ideas for sure. Yeah, well, like one sentence. Oh, this. And then right. most things never a go past that. Ghost in a high school. <laughs> right. Yeah, most things never go past that that one sentence. But um, yeah, I once I start in on... Well, by the time, you know, since the pitch is so elaborate, once I pitch something, if they're like, hey, let's do it, I do have the the pilot sort of, I know what the big moves are that are going to happen in it. But um, God, once you start writing anything, it just starts coming apart. You're going, oh, who cares? Like, <laughs> why? There seems to be such a thing when you put it down on paper that it becomes more important than it is. Like with stand-up, I don't, get in my head and go, who cares about this? I go, yeah, nobody cares. We're here to laugh. But when you put on paper, whether it's a book or a pilot or a script, it's like suddenly seems important. Like you're putting this on paper. This better change the world. And and I can get hard on myself and go, who gives a fuck? But it's not changing the world. It's just yet another thing you, to make people laugh. And you try to have the same attitude about it as you do stand up. You just put it down and convince yourself it's not important because you wrote two books. Yeah. Right? And all the TV pilots. So you're putting a lot of stuff down on paper. Yeah. And I, those things that I put down on paper, I make me, they're just, they're harder for me to love. They're just, they're, you can always go back and perfect them. Oh yeah. I hear you. Yeah. And when you speak, it's ephemeral and it's out and it's gone and there's no. Exactly. Unless it's a special. And well, you know, and this is the worst thing ever. My Nana who's now dead, she's died at 99. She started taking antidepressants in her late 80s. And I said to her once, oh my God, this is so sad. You, your whole life, you've had depression. And society didn't really allow for such things. And now finally, and she goes, I'm not, I was never depressed. She goes, I'm depressed now because I'm 88. And she said, I can't stop living. That would have been wow. the greatest punchline for this whole <laughs> bit I did in my special called Just Keep Living. I talk about how my friend had this like inspirational story from her grandfather from the Holocaust where it was some, some, her family had all these inspirational stories, things that would make great tattoos, whether they were expressions or the, whatever. And then I have nothing because my family, nothing is inspiring about them. So I had to get a Matthew McConaughey phrase tattooed on me. Right. And the perfect thing to end it would have been that my Nana said, I can't stop living. But I didn't think of it. It would have gone perfectly. I <laughs> never found a great button for the end of that joke. And then I was like, I have been doing that joke about my Nana forever. And I just, it's not a joke that's part of anything. It's like, I forget it. Sometimes I say it on stage. Sometimes I don't. Would have been perfect. It drives me crazy a little bit, but I'm also like, nobody knows watching that special. They had a laugh, they're out, who cares? But if it were like in a book or in a script, it would drive me insane. Well, I then don't you know why. you could change it. You could presumably <laughs> update it, right? I'm re-releasing a book for two sentences. You, co you couldn't, like you're not gonna, your book comes out, it's out. Like if, yeah, you know. I do it all the time. Like if I self-publish a book, mm -hmm. so I do it, some self-published, some traditionally published. Right. I love self-publishing because if I think of something new, I just put it in and upload the new book. It's like no big deal. And then nobody sees the old one? No, they don't see the old one anymore. I, <laughs> it's I pretty like great. That. I, yeah. You should think about it for your next book. <laughs> anyway, Jen, it's been great talking to you. Oh, yeah. I'm excited to see how your career unfolds from here as you get older and wiser. And Thank you. And more Carlin-ish. I think it's going to be great. <laughs> so thanks for your time. You're so welcome. Thanks for listening to the How to Write Funny podcast. If you're looking for insight into how to write better comedy, visit howtowritefunny.com for free ebooks and other resources to boost your comedy career.